It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, feeling the heat. Record-breaking temps impacting millions this morning just as kids are headed back to school. When you step inside like a, any classroom, it's like so hot, so humid. What some districts are doing to keep students safe. And Al's got the full forecast. Then, remembering Bob Barker. New details surrounding the Price is Right host's secret health battle as tributes continue to pour in for the television icon. Come on now! All the details straight ahead. Plus, the original influencer. We're taking a look at Princess Diana's lasting impact, including the famous black sheep sweater that made headlines. And it is right here in Studio 1A as it goes up for auction. And summer of country. We're taking a look at the genre that's dominated the charts from last night to a fast car. How country became the sound of the season today, Wednesday, September 6, 2023. Get up to my friends in Creighton Middle School in Columbia, South Carolina. Besties since college. 50 years of friendship. From Plymouth. And Verona, Wisconsin. Happy birthday to our mom, Teresa. My son, Riley. And Palmer, Alaska. Good morning to my Aunt Andrea. In Rochester, New York. On a road trip across America. From Morrison, Colorado. Hi to our parents. Back in Tippecanoe, Ohio. We love you. Visiting from Virginia Beach. And Chesapeake, Virginia. On a girl's trip to New York City. Because today is my 50th birthday from Conway, Arkansas. Woo! Welcome back on a sunny September day. Princess Diana, of course, was a global icon. The events she attended, the causes she supported, even the clothes she wore captured the world's attention. Well, this morning, one of her most talked about fashion choices is right here in our studio. There it is, the sweater with that lone black sheep. It's featured in Sotheby's inaugural fashion icon sale. I'm gonna have more on it in a moment, but first, a little more on the enduring legacy of the People's Princess. Princess Diana was a global phenomenon. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Her fairy tale wedding to Prince Charles in 1981 was watched by 750 million people. It began a legacy not just of the glitz and glamour of royal life, but the Princess of Wales using her platform and star power to make a difference. She drew attention to pressing issues such as AIDS and landmines in Angola. She had a profound impact on parents worldwide, so often present for her sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, even while juggling royal duties. In terms of her legacy, it is shining as bright as ever across the nation. And top of the list remains the fact that she used her platform to help those less uh, fortunate than she was. And Diana's fashion choices are still talked about today, too. She made headlines dancing with John Travolta at the White House. She went against royal tradition, foregoing gloves so she could shake hands with the public. And of course, that unforgettable revenge dress. I think in many ways, Princess Diana was the original influencer. She really steered fashion with the choices she made. One of Princess Diana's most iconic looks, the black sheep sweater. Then Lady Diana Spencer wore the playful sweater to a polo match in 1981, instantly causing a frenzy, transforming the small knit shop, warm and wonderful, into a global brand. Diana found out very early that everything she wore was analyzed. People were trying to see hidden messages uh, in all her, her clothes. It was decided that she loved this sweater because the black sheep perhaps represented her, that she wasn't uh, following the herd when it came uh, to her fashion choices or even other choices she was making, that she was prepared to be a bit different. In 2020, the black sheep sweater was featured in an episode of Netflix hit show, The Crown. That same year, Warm and Wonderful reissued Princess Diana's signature sweater to high demand. More than 25 years after her death, Princess Diana's effortless style and impactful life continue to inspire. As we mentioned, the black sheep sweater is featured in Sotheby's fashion icon sale. It goes on public display tomorrow at Sotheby's right here in New York. Frank Everett is the vice chairman of Sotheby's. Good morning, Frank. Good to see you. Good morning. Thanks I mean, me. I just want to touch this so bad, but I, would, I, I can't snag the sweater. Well, we could just have one little 
Right there. Okay, there it is. That's oh, the tear. So, okay, so now you've got, oh, my That's paper was in the way, see it. Okay, so we're allowed to touch the tear. Yeah. The tear is really at the heart of the story. Can you give me the backstory on how this sweater was rediscovered? Yes, it's amazing. The sweater has been tucked away in an attic for more than 40 years. This is the original sweater she wore in this 1981. Okay. Made by Warm and Wonderful, very small knitwear brand in England. And um, Diana owned the sweater. Not sure how she acquired it. Did she buy it herself? Was it a gift? However, she wore it in 1981 in the picture that you see yeah. to the polo match. She tore the sweater and then she sent it back to the ladies at Warm and Wonderful. She asked for either a repair or a replacement. So this, then she got the replacement sweater, wore it again exactly. in 1983. Now, meanwhile, turns out this sweater is sitting in the basement or at a, where was it? At the Warm and Wonderful shop? It was in, the, in their attic, and literally when, in their attic. And they, they, just, it in a box. they, they just discovered it? Tell me about that. They just discovered it this past March, and we love a discovery <laughs> story in, in the auction world. Yes. So um, apparently when the letter came from the palace requesting a new one, they said either a repair or replacement. They decided to knit her a new one, and there are some design differences in the second one that she wore and someone just threw it in a box and it went to the attic. It's amazing. 40 years later, now here it is at Sotheby's. It's just incredible. And just to be clear, you guys did all the forensics or what, oh. however you identify a sweater, like this is the original sweater. This is the original sweater. We did extensive photo matching. We even used a third party source to do some of that authentication work. And this is absolutely Now, how much will something like this go for, do you think? Well, the uh, estimate online right now, the online bidding is open. Yeah. The auction estimate was fifty to eighty thousand okay. dollars it's already at seventy thousand dollars online going up going, going up, up okay going. that's what the auctioneer would like to hear and it won't sell until the 14th with okay. clo closing bidding on the 14th and it also comes if you for the low low price of whatever it'll be tens of thousands of dollars you get two letters what are the letters you do you get the first letter written by um oliver everett her um personal secretary okay. when she was still lady diana Spencer. requesting the repair or the refund correct and then the second one was a thank you note okay. because they sent the new sweater. It's really fun. It's fun to have it here. People who buy these kinds of things, do they display them or they wear them? Well, I don't know that this will be worn. Maybe it'll be worn on a special occasion. Yeah. I would imagine it will be displayed by a, a collector who loved Diana or perhaps an institution. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see it go to a, go to a museum. Very interesting. Okay, yeah. Frank, nice to have you here. You. Sweater, good to see you again. <laughs> you can see this sweater yourself. It's on display at Sotheby's here in New York starting tomorrow. You can go for free, right? You can come open to the public tomorrow morning. I love it. Have fun. Best time of the morning. It is pop well, Let's get to it. we got a lot to get to today. We're going to start with Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner. The Hollywood couple is calling it quits. Today.com exclusively obtaining a petition for dissolution of marriage filed by Joe Jonas yesterday in Miami-Dade County. The document states the marriage between the parties is irreachable. Joe and Sophie's two young children have been living with Jonas but that it's in the best interest that they have shared parental responsibility. The pop singer and Game of Thrones star announced their engagement back in 2017 before tying the knot in 2019. Next up, the supermodels, a new trailer has just dropped for the upcoming documentary series featuring fashion icons, Naomi Campbell, Cindy Crawford, Linda Evangelista, and Christy Turlington. Have a look. We get this phone call, George Michael wants to shoot us in his video. We made a decision, I will do it. I'm gonna do it. Yes, okay, I'll do it. Freedom. Everything changed. You can start to call the shots and be an active participant in your career. All of a sudden, we were the physical representations of power. I wanted to go further. I wanted to push the envelope. They brought their artistry to the image. They would see things we didn't necessarily see. They're like the Mona Lisa, the face of her era. They're larger than life. They still look incredible. Yep. This is much later. All of them. They are. Not one of them has fallen off. They're ageless. Unbelievable. The supermodel starts streaming September 20th. You can watch that on Apple TV Plus. And tomorrow, a programming note, we're going to have a special conversation oh. with the one and only Naomi Campbell wow. herself. Please tune in yeah. for that. You're not going to want to miss it. All right, next up, Billboard with Labor Day now behind us. The music streaming charts is wrapping up its 2023 Songs of Summer. So which tracks top the list this summer? Let's count them down, starting at five, shall we? Coming oh, in at five, one. All My Life. What a collab between Lil Durk and J. Cole. This one's dropped back in May and spent 16 weeks on the Billboard Hot 100. Okay. We'll keep it going to number four. Miley had a hit record this summer with Endless Summer Vacation. That first single, Flowers, was massive back in May. Uh, it became the fastest song to reach one billion streams in Spotify history. Next up, Selena Gomez takes third. Thanks to that dancey Calm Down, Down track with I love Rema. this song. 
Uh, song's been out for over a year, yet still dominating the charts. We move on to, it was definitely the summer of country. Luke Combs snagging the number two spot with his record-breaking cover of the classic from Tracy Chapman from the 80s called Fast Car. Any guesses as to what's number one right now on the Billboard? That's how they do it. Like, what happens to be number one as summer is ending? Uh, Margarita. Oh, no. It was oh, the summer of country. It's yeah. it's country. It is country, and it's not Morgan Wallen, because Morgan had a huge oh, summer. I thought it was the last night. Let's roll song. the tape. Okay. What is it? Oh, it last night we lit the liquor talk. I can't remember everything we said, but we said it all. He told me that you wish I was Okay, so Morgan does get the nod for the for last night being song of the summer, but it is the first time that a country song hit number one on the season ending chart since 1974. That's country music's dominance isn't slowing down. Zach Bryan and Casey Musgraves, mm. they have a great duet called I Remember Everything, and that just hit the top spot wow. on the Billboard Hot 100 as we sit here. So. There you go. Finally, Peyton and Eli Manning, the famous football bros, are looking for apparently a third co-host to join them on their new season of their popular Manning cast. And in a new video on YouTube, they're revealing a sneak peek inside those star-studded and quite funny auditions. I mean, we're honored you'd even consider auditioning for the Manning cast. Manning what? Oh, no, I was calling to bundle my home and auto. Aren't you the insurance guy? Will Arnett, actor. I also have a comedy show, and uh, we interview a ton of celebrities. And watch a football game at the same time? Uh, no. Guess it's just the two of us again this season. <laughs> Unless there's someone on that list who is just perfect for the job. Nope. I didn't get the Manny cast job. I guess I'll just come back and play football again. <laughs> Cute. Nice. That's like 30 big stars. Yeah. Uh, we are coming back after your local news weather. It's quick message. We're back at 8.37 with today's Consumer with Barbie's record-breaking success at the box office. There's renewed interest in dolls, you might imagine. You might be actually surprised what kind of toys are in that toy yeah, aisle. NBC's Vicky Wynn is here with hey. a doll and yes. a story. Good morning. Yeah, you have her here, Jilly. We'll pass her around in a minute. But, you know, I haven't been in the doll aisle for quite a while because my girls are a little bit older. So I sort of just assume there are plenty of diverse dolls to choose from. It's 2023 after all. But I got a lesson on what representation in the toy box looks like after meeting a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome and Mattel's fashionista line featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian 
because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Max says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we started out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles and it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're gonna see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at The Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And here she is. So Mac officially launched Jilly Bang on August 1st. The dolls go for $68 each. She's nearly, she's sold nearly 1,500 so far, and they're really busy getting ready for that holiday rush. Mac says the company actually plans to create a whole world of Jilly Bang dolls representing different Asian American mm -hmm. ethnicities, cartoons, boy dolls. And in case you're wondering where she got the name, Jilly is short for Jillian, her mm -hmm. daughter, and Bang is part of the Mandarin word for cookie. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pass her around so you can feel her hair. And so you, like, does you Jilly have a backstory there. like the American Girl dolls, like so she involved? Does. Her whole thing her is that she loves to bake with her grandmother, and that's why this hat is reversible, and oh. it becomes a little egg tart, which is a very now common Asian Jilly dessert. Yeah, yeah. She's pretty beautiful. I got to tell you, I remember for Courtney, when the American Girl doll came out with a, with their black doll from the late 1800s, yeah. it was a game changer oh, for her because she saw somebody who looked like her. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what I said, Al. If I had had this doll when I was growing up, it would have made a big difference for me in sort of thinking about the standard of beauty that mm -hmm. girls grow up yeah. with, and yeah. boys too, yeah. you know, what's out there. If it looks like you, it makes you feel more like you belong. Representation yeah. matters. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it's it. about time. It. Thank you, Vic. That was nice good. Work. Thanks, Vic. All right, coming up, guys, we're going to head into the kitchen with Laura Lee. Simple dishes that you can whip up in a flash. But first, this is Today on NBC.
we're back with my favorite today food. School is starting. Weeknights are going to start getting busy again in the household, and that can make it a little difficult to get dinner on the table. And if you're looking for just something quick, something, a lot of flavor, Laura Lee here has got some recipes for you. She's James Beard Award winning cookbook and author. The second cookbook is called A Splash of Soy. Laura, it's out now. Congratulations. Good morning. I think people watching in general are a little uh, intimidated to cook Asian food because of the complexities and depths of flavor. But this cookbook says it's just you have easy recipes. Yeah, cooking should be as easy as a splash of soy when it comes to Asian food. And when you think of the flavors that you can get in the supermarkets these days, soy sauce, you know, sesame oil, garlic, ginger shallots, it's all there. So um, Asian food can be very accessible for everyone these days and, and really easy. What recipe did you bring today? Okay, I'm making I it a meat, steak for breakfast. Yes, yeah. you know, oh, it's grilling season, my own guys. Heart. Yeah, put on your apron. Friends. So you went for the beautiful cut of the oh flank Oh my steak. goodness. So the flank is actually a part of the cow's uh, abdominal muscle. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite a tough cut unless you cook it kind of on, on more on the medium, medium rare side. Mm -hmm. But it's got a really lovely loose grain so it absorbs all the marinades. Um, and this but, is a popular Asian meat, right? This is typically the meat in the stir fry. Oh yeah, you can use flank. I mean, you could use also, you could use a skirt steak, you could use a sirloin, okay. you can use, a, you know, ribeye, scotch fillet, lots of different flavors. But what I'm doing, I'm putting a lot a lot of pungent kind of, uh, I guess, aromatics and seasonings mm -hmm. as the marinade for this lucky beef Shalots. steak. Well, I think shalots, shalots. there's shalots. no shallots in this one. Okay. Oh. We've got garlic. What's in a five ginger. spice? Can so you name all five? I can name all five. So we've got Szechuan peppercorns. It's going to give you a nice little tingling sensation on the tongue. Mm -hmm. You've got a Chinese cinnamon, fennel, uh, star anise. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, I definitely That's recommend how it smell. Yeah. Okay. And that five mm, spice is going to give this steak a really good kick. So what I'm going to get you to do is to kind of close kind of the bag and just start to give it a back rub. Like, you know, yeah, make the cow feel good. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a Wednesday rub, morning. Hello. It's had a tough day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. And you'll marinate this for how long, ideally? Well, ideally overnight. But yeah. honestly, this book is all about quick and easy cooking. So you can marinate it for 30 minutes, and it's already got a really amazing flavor. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to chuck this beautiful steak onto a really nice hot griddle pan. Mm-hmm. And the way to test the doneness of your steak. Have you guys ever done the face test? Yes. So which one? Have you done no. the face test? I just no. poke it. No, what's the oh, face okay. test? Okay, the face test is, okay, cheek, medium rare. Yeah. Chin, medium. Okay. Forehead, medium well. Okay. Skull, well done. Oh you don't want skull. You don't want skull. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> I want chunky cheek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've nice never medium heard rare. That. I've been to his restaurant. Oh, no, that's chunky cheese. Yeah, it's good. All right. Body, smell that? That is great. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. Right so now you're cutting. You're going to let it rest, of course. I'm going to let it rest because that lets the juices redistribute through the steak. Yep. Okay. How I'm long do you let it rest? I'm, you know, you want to let it rest for a minimum of five minutes, right? So oh. that's just going to let the juices, because it's all kind of constricted when it right. cooks, it's going to kind of do its thing. You've got to cut against the grain on this particular oh, yeah. cut. Yeah. Very fibrous. Exactly. And then don't let that marinade go to waste. I reduce it oh, on the hob, and then I drizzle it on like a little oh, bit of a gravy on top. Oh, yes. Extra flavor. So good. Okay. Really good. How is the meat, guys? Oh, great. Yeah, it's it's Delicious. a it's a good recipe. You have it, have it, it. I put it in a taco flavor. too and make an yeah. Asian taco. Yeah, 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 great. All right, what do you got next? You okay. got the um, sweet potato. Okay, this wedge. is like totally elevating the uh, sweet potato to the next level. Oh. So this is three ingredients really: tom yum paste, sweet potato, garlic. Mm -hmm. You stir what the. What is tom yum paste? So tom yum paste is famous for tom yum soup from Thailand. So it's spicy, it's sour, it's yep. fiery. We've got lemongrass, galangal, chili, ginger. You're gonna cut the. Uh, Sweet potato into wedges, and then Carson, I'm going to get you Good. to toss this marinade in with the tom yum sweet potatoes. This has yeah, a great turn, turn that steak for me. Thank that's you. That's a great kick. We're going to give it a little season, so yep. we're going to toss it with the marinade. Why do you like the sweet potato? Oh, because it's actually quite sweet inside. It caramelizes with the marinade, yep. and what you get when you cook it with this beautiful garlic, mm. which I'm oh, going to squeeze on top into, mm. oh, you get this talking. beautiful yeah. caramelized, creamy kind of sensation. <laughs> Everything is absolutely beautiful, but it's so easy. And you just bake it in the oven, 425 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 minutes. How did you get this garlic like this? You just pop it it's in the oven. It's a full clove cut in half? Yeah. Cut in half. Just pop no it on. No oil on top of it or anything like oh, that? Oh, yeah. You add a little bit of oil uh -huh. so it doesn't burn. Yep. But then you just roast it in the oven. It's got a little bite to it. And yeah. then you We're squeeze it. Essentially, you're putting it back in the oven. So yeah. it's a, like twice and baked garlic. And you guys garlic. are going to smell of garlic. But mm -hmm. if you're not smelling of garlic at the end of a meal, you're not doing it right, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's yeah, delicious. It's so taste. terrific. Let's go. Well I mean, the flavors between yeah. these two yeah. things are. She's got a recipe in her book for a kimchi 
grilled cheese. That kimchi grilled I, cheese? I can't wait to try it. Right. kimchi grilled cheese. It's Thank you to Laura. Heavenly. You can find these recipes and a whole lot more at the website today.com slash food. We are back mm. in a moment. But first, this is today on NBC. Oh, yeah. We're going Thank back to the It is time to celebrate some birthdays. That's right. Let's spin those Smucker's jars. Put some of that Smucker's orange marmalade on some of that steak. Put mm. on the broil. That'd be pretty good. First up, happy 100th birthday to Claire Cohen of North Hills, New York. Love spending time with the grandkids, especially her great-granddaughter, who was born this summer. Congratulations, Claire. William Goodwine is from Columbia, South Carolina, God's country, an avid reader, 100 years old, served in the Navy during World War II. We salute you for your service, sir. Happy 100th birthday to Samuel Connington, a line dancer from Santa Fe, New Mexico. When he's not line dancing, Samuel likes to stay active by going on daily walks. Uh, I Ione Reitz is from Belois. Wisconsin, a piano woman celebrating 100 years. She's known as the queen of the bingo room in her senior living community. Robert Coyne of Webster, New York is 100, part of the Rochester Police Department for more than 30 years before he retired. And happy 100th birthday to Sidney Edson, a golfer from Lake Worth, Florida. He's hit four holes in one in his lifetime. Go, known for his great smile around town. Why has he got a great smile? Because he's hit four he's holes in one. How many have you had? None. Really? None. That's impressive. Yeah, thanks You're for bringing it on. Well, yeah, maybe your charity golf tournament. Yes. Out. I'll get my first. It's going to happen. I love it. Uh, coming up in just a few minutes, one of our favorites around here, Christopher Maloney. He's going to be here. First, though, on the third hour, we're going to celebrate National Read a Book Day with some really what great the ladies of today. What to the add to your today? list. Uh, first day of school. Oh, yeah. 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 After your local news, you love it. This morning on the third hour of today, September bringing record-breaking heat. I'd rather it be this weather when I'm at the beach or anywhere but school. <laughs> Making a return to classrooms without AC especially challenging. We've got the scorching forecast and when you can expect some relief. Plus, American tennis players shining at the U.S. Open. What a performance, and yeah, he is just living the dream right there. As the next generation of stars make history. I think today was definitely the best that I played the whole all tournament, regardless of the score. Is the American tennis drought at the Open finally over? We've got the highlights. And they made it. A pair of entrepreneurs made in shoe heaven, out to solve a footwear dilemma. 
they're stylish flats and they look great, but they're secretly a sliver. How they built a million dollar brand. Today, Wednesday, September 6th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third hour of today. We've got the whole gang back together. Al, Chanel, Craig, what day is it? Hump day! It's also oh, my nephew's No, I did it. Oh, he did it? Yeah, yeah it was a little oh, it, day. There we go. Quick, 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 quick. It's Woo-hoo! also my nephew Jake's birthday today. It's happy his birthday, 11th birthday, Jake. so happy birthday, Jake. Happy birthday, Jake. Yeah. Good to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, have, we have a phenomenal story in the works. Um, we'll tell you about it in weeks to come. So I wasn't off. I was on assignment. Oh, that's yeah. a nice Good tease. reporting wow. coming up. Okay. Yeah. Our top story today, though, You've probably experienced it yourself. This late summer heat wave, record-breaking temperatures, sweltering large swaths of this country right now, making back to school just a little more challenging. As Some districts are forced to cut the days short to keep students safe. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren, she's in Concord, New Hampshire, where temperatures may reach 90, perhaps even higher than 90 today. So, Kristen, this, this heat posing some major issues for kids heading back to school. What's the latest from there? Yeah, you know, Craig, I was watching uh, for our piece that we did earlier, these interviews from kids around the country, and the one thing they were all talking about was the sweat, literally Mm -hmm. sticking to their desk. Because think about it, a lot Mm -hmm. of schools don't have air conditioning, especially in places like this where they don't really see this type of temperature during the school year that often. And so schools are having to make adjustments. In some places, that means a shorter day. Uh, Here, they've been limiting outdoor recess. They're looking at whether they're going to have to cancel outdoor sports again this afternoon because while the temperature is going to be uh, close to 90 or maybe a little above it is going to feel like mid to high 90s so some really sweltering temperatures ahead 81 million americans across 18 states are now under heat alerts yesterday we saw 40 records broken today 50 records are at risk so it is going to be hot in a lot of places a lot of really hot children out there i mean kristen is there anything parents can do i remember being on the bus and you get up and there's like sweat. Yeah, you know, into the that seat. leather on the seat. Yeah. But anything for kids, you know, maybe when they get on the bus or even sweaty classrooms. Right, and that's a good point because, you know, think about it. A lot of buses aren't air conditioned yeah. either and kids can mm-hmm. spend a long time on the bus going to school, coming back. So parents, think about it. Maybe you can drive them today in the air conditioning if that's possible. Make sure they have water bottles with them. Hydration is going to be key. A lot of schools are going to have some extra cooling stations out, coolers with water uh, for kids. And then, of course, dressing appropriately in those cool clothes and, and teaching them about staying in the shade when they can and um, you know just really knowing and understanding how exertion in this type of heat could be dangerous all right Kristen you get inside now too yeah. thank Good you advice. you know the interesting thing I think school boards <laughs> will do uh, thanks Kristen all, all across especially in places like Concord and places like that because of climate change they're gonna have to rethink Getting retrofitting really their schools about about you know mitigating for this kind of heat because Those giant not, metal fans yeah, only do so this much. is not going away so wow. speaking of uh, hydration in my house to encourage Delano and Sybil to okay. drink water we have a we have a motto what is it What's that? hydrate or dihydrate Oh, jeez. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's a little extreme, but I, I, but I guess wow. it gets but, the point. But it's very Let me guess created that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Dang, Craig. But, Craig, but you know what? It works. Craig's got one, bourbon or squirming. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look, show you what's uh, going on as far as these temperatures. Uh, over the next three days, it, it's going to be starting off hot in the northeast and around the Great Lakes, but then a front comes through and drops those temperatures. Look at Chicago from 84 to 69, Washington 100 to, uh, to 90, but down south, the temperature is going to stay in the 90s and the low 100s. And we've also got what is now Tropical Storm Lee, which will most likely rapidly intensify, uh, become a major hurricane. The American model keeps it uh, north of Puerto Rico this week and then curve toward Bermuda next week. European model is pretty much in agreement. But keep in mind, this is seven to 10 days out. So we're going to have to really watch this. But we, the one thing we do know, this will become possibly category three, maybe even a four uh, mm. before we can figure out where it's going so we'll be watching this all week. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well speaking of hot American tennis players, they are heating up the courts at the US Open this year. We're days away from the finals, but it's already 
feeling like a win for Team USA. NBC's Stephanie Gosk joins us on this story. Good morning. Oh, All right, guys, good morning. Listen, you don't have to be a tennis fan. This is so much <laughs> this is fun awesome. to watch this year. American tennis is having a moment, and it's even sweeter on U.S. soil. For the first time in more than 50 years, four black Americans played in the quarterfinals Tuesday, and two of them, Coco Goff and Ben Shelton, punched their tickets to the semifinals, leading this new generation of talented American tennis stars. Overnight, history unfolding at center court. 20-year-old Ben Shelton taking on 25-year-old Francis Tiafo. The first time two black American men have faced off in the U.S. Open quarterfinals. And it was a nail-biter. This is not anything that I would expect. After four sets on a humid New York night, Shelton using his high-speed serve to beat his friend and fellow countryman. What a performance. And yeah, he is just living a dream right there. The young star celebrating his win with the crowd. Shelton now the youngest American man to reach the semifinals since Andy Roddick in 2003. A lot of Americans we love that. Americans are indeed having a moment. Earlier Tuesday, 19-year-old tennis superstar Coco Gauff smashed her way to her first ever U.S. Open semifinals, winning her 10th match in a row, defeating Latvian Yelena Ostapenko in straight sets. I think today was definitely the best that I played the whole all tournament, regardless of the score. She's the first American teen to reach the U.S. Open semifinals since Serena Williams more than two decades ago. She's my idol, and I think if you told me when I was younger that I would be in the same like stat lines as her, I would freak out. When Williams stepped away from the sport after last year's U.S. Open, many wondered what American tennis would look like without her. But now Goff and really her fellow American like players are proving they have what it takes to fill those very big beat. tennis shoes. But not every American made it through. Novak Djokovic beat Taylor Fritz. Continuing his streak, he has never lost to an American at the U.S. Open. The number two ranked Serbian celebrating his win, singing a Beastie Boys tune. Well, you got to fight for your right to party. Djokovic is heading into his 47th semifinal match, passing Roger Federer with the most Grand Slam semifinals ever with a new generation of American tennis stars looking to hold serve on their home court. We have a real opportunity to get some trophies maybe on all ends of the event, and that would be really exciting, but it's a great time to be an American tennis player. So today we'll have another chance to watch Americans take the court when Madison Keys plays in a quarterfinals match. If she wins, it would be one step closer to an all-American U.S. Open finals with Coco Goff, which would be super exciting. Goff will also play in the doubles quarterfinals with her partner Jessica Pegula. And Ben Shelton will pair up with Taylor Townsend for the mixed doubles semis. That happens today. Uh, exciting times. Yeah. This is an interesting stat. Ben Shelton was ranked 165 earlier this summer. Yeah. Wow. At the end of the U.S. Open, he will be in the top 20. That's wow. Crazy. Good for yeah. him. It's yeah, like you said, awesome. even if you're not a diehard tennis fan, yeah. anybody yeah. can oh, get on board with You can't help but get into it. Yeah. yeah, and these kids, and I'll call them kids because I can. That's right. yeah. <laughs> Are super fun to watch. That's the super U.S.A. Fun to watch. U.S.A. Good U.S.A. Thank, Thank you, Steph. You just All right. Good. Okay, still ahead on the third hour of today, the power of a good habit, how to break a bad one, and how to be more productive in our everyday lives. And then later in She Made It, how two women transform comfy house slippers into a footwear line and a booming business. Third hour today, I'll be right back.
on today's checklist, we're going to get back into the swing of things this fall by implementing good habits into our mm. lives. But how do we make those habits last? Well, here to guide us is board-certified psychiatrist, Dr. Sue Varma. Dr. Varma, good to Thank see you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Great to you. have you good back. Morning. So, so first of all, what, what constitutes a habit? Yes. So the anatomy of, of a habit is having an intention. I want to make a change. Mm -hmm. um, and then having a decision-making plan. How am I going to make that change? Then you want to act get everything lined up and put it in motion. And the final and most important piece is automation because we want it to become routine. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so have, a, oh, a habit is routine, right? Absolutely, yes. And we, we have eliminated choice because a lot of times people say, you know, I don't make good choices. And the reality is a choice is the enemy of habit, right? Because we are subject to decision-making fatigue. I'm motivated, I'm not mm -hmm. motivated, I'm tired. So we want to be able to routinize something as much as possible. Okay, so a lot of kids going back to school now. Why is this a good time to start a new habit? Yes, so fall is a good time just as any. People think it has to be the beginning of the year and I don't agree with that. Anytime you want to have a change in your life, you want to streamline something. You want to make it simple and automated. Going back to school is crazy making for a lot of parents. <laughs> it so is. You really want to have things in place. You know, and what we don't really is that so much of our habits are determined by our emotions, our attitudes, our behaviors. All of this determine our habits, and our habits determine our health. Mm. People don't realize that 80% of our health is determined by our habits, Ooh. and we can change that. People don't realize. They think genetics is so important. Oh, I, my family has a diabetes and cholesterol. There's nothing I can do. 80%, so it's huge. And what we need, need to realize is that you have far more control than you think. People want to leave things to choice, but if I say if you want to get something done, you want to make it a habit. Okay. Uh, just really quickly, because I've seen the word automate come up twice. Yes. H how does one automate a habit? Yes. So here's the thing is you have to really eliminate barriers. So that's where the decision making comes in to say, what is going to be easy for me? A lot of times people want to do two new habits at once. Yeah. For example, you want to have a workout routine. Don't do it at five in the morning if you happen to not be a morning person, right? So if you are not a morning person, that is not the time to start something. So you want to make something easy. You want to make it accessible. You want to make it fun. Get a buddy in with you. Sure. Say, let's meet after work, 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Let's meet at the track. Let's go for a jog. Um, and you want to keep it new and you want to keep it fresh. How do you distinguish between a good habit and a, and a bad habit? Yes. So here's the thing, Craig, is that bad habits really are not about bad choices. They're really about not having a habit at all, mm. right? And so what happens is, let's say 10 p.m. at night, last night, I was like, oh, I'm kind of stressed. I'm preparing for a talk. I've got a lot of stuff to do. And I want to lean in the fridge. And I'm like, no. No, I don't do that. I don't right. eat. That's just for me personally. That yes, no. that's your habit. And that's it. Because I was like, what do I choose? No, I'm, it's not a matter of making choice because at 10 p.m. at night, I have already made the average person makes 30,000 choices in a day. Ooh, 200 what? of them are of food alone. Mm, and we I do know that. when we look at judges, when we look at doctors, they have less mercy for people at the end of the day. Judges don't want to give parole to, the, to people. Mm -hmm. Doctors are not giving out pain medication at the end of the day because they're tired. And mm -hmm. we don't want to mm -hmm. leave it to that kind of decision making. I won't do a forecast lately. I mean, <laughs> we only have about a minute left. I was yes. looking at your steps towards a routine, making yes. habits easy. You've talked about that. Associate with positive emotions, a time or a place. And then I see you have habit stacking. I don't yes. know. What is habit yes. stacking? So habit stacking is taking something. If you already have a good habit, let's say you happen to drink a lot of water and you keep your bottle at your desk where it's visible and you need to take vitamins and that's not something that's new or you need to take medication. Do it at the time that you drink the water. So you want to pair. Something that you're already doing. Something that you're already doing. Pair it together. Okay. And in terms of being able to maintain good habits, because a a lot of times people say I can start it, but I fall off the wagon about a month in and that's totally normal. You want to keep things new and exciting. You change it up a little bit. If you're somebody who happens to say, okay, I took a Pilates mat class, but I'm kind of getting bored of it, but I, I, I did like it. So up it, up the ante a little bit and say, maybe I'll do the reformer. If you've been jogging for a year and have a challenge, say I'm going to do a 5K, maybe next year I'll do a 10K, maybe I'll do a half marathon. Okay. Do it with a buddy, be accountable, have a habit tracker, keep a journal, keep a spreadsheet. One habit um, th th thing that I love is, let's say you're not somebody who remembers or wants to wake up in the morning, give your sneakers the night before to a neighbor or to a friend and say, we're going to work out together. You bring my oh. shoes, I bring your shoes. Oh, wow. yeah. that's funny. That's I like that's idea. a good oh, sneaker one. Sneaker swap. Right. Yeah. Sneaker swap. Okay, that's right. really good. And then you want it, you're held accountable because you have their sneakers. Yep. Yes, yes. Exactly. yes. And some of us are more accountable to others than we exactly. are to ourselves. Totally. Very Dr. Very Varma, great, great advice. Good advice. Really Thanks great. so much. Really Thank appreciate you. that. For more on building good habits, go to today.com. Awesome. All right. Well, coming up next, two women set out to solve a problem in footwear, turning comfortable slippers into stylish shoes. And that has even 
gotten the likes of Meghan Markle. And later, Carlos and Alexa Penavega in studio with their new book that challenges readers to make the world a better place. We're going to catch up with them when we come right back. installment of one of our favorite series, She Made It. Two friends set out to solve a problem in footwear, staying fashionable and comfortable in and outside of the house. Our Today Lifestyle and Commerce contributor, Jill Martin Brooks, shares how that one idea has now grown into a multi-million dollar company. We were just kind of frustrated at the lack of fashionable shoes for the home. And I thought, this is funny. Like, why hasn't somebody solved this problem? Bianca Gates and Marissa Sharkey are a pair made in shoe heaven. The entrepreneurial duo is behind the women's footwear brand, Birdies, that combines style, comfort, and versatility. They're stylish flats and they look great, but they're secretly a slipper. The idea for Birdies was hatched in 2015, the year Bianca and Marissa became friends while living in Manhattan. Tell me how you met. Our husbands were going to business school on the West Coast, and they made the connection that their girlfriends at the time were living in New York and they should set us up. But we totally hit it off because we both just have a love of entertaining friends and family, and we are both incredibly driven professionally. Bianca was working at Facebook overseeing retail partnerships, and Marissa was group vice president of strategy at Ross Stores. One day, Bianca sent Marissa an idea. And I just texted her stylish slippers, and she said, I'm in. The goal was to create the perfect indoor slipper, stylish enough to entertain company and comfortable after a long day. Where do you start? Well, start. first I, we started with Google. You know, how to make shoes. And that I mean, led to nowhere. So. And that's like, like that's literally what you did. How to literally make shoes. how to make shoes. Cutting them in our living room and gluing different things together and just kind of understanding like what are the components in here. What we learned very quickly is that slippers are made in a slipper factory and shoes are made in a shoe factory. And we wanted to combine those two things and that was unheard of. They invested $100,000 to start the business found a manufacturer, and nine months later launched Birdies with just 1,800 pairs of slippers. We couldn't afford to buy half sizes, okay. so we only had full sizes, which is insane because they're meant to fit you perfectly. Right. <laughs> so it was a bit of a disaster. Their initial investment went entirely to production costs. So with no money left for advertising or marketing, they hosted trunk shows and pop-up sales among friends, family, and acquaintances. We had celebrity stylists reaching out. We had editors reaching out, wanting to talk about the social slipper. Birdie's success soared once the duo sent a pair to Meghan Markle in 2016. She would be caught by paparazzi just wearing us. And then there was speculation that she was dating Prince Harry, and we thought, gosh, can you even believe like, <laughs> right. if, if she's You're dating a prince, prince right. you know? And they had announced their engagement, and the headlines everywhere were birdies, the slipper fit for a princess. <laughs> and it just was like, we just could not believe it. I have the right. It's like yeah. if you wrote the book. Totally. You, you can't, you can't write, write the book. book. You right. just have like to Cinderella. be. Cinderella. It's like yeah. Cinderella. They sold out quickly and had a 30,000-person wait list. Bianca and Marissa then raised more funds to create more versatile shoes. 
we introduced like a broader product line, not just shoes that you would necessarily want to wear at home, but sneakers that were very comfortable. Birdies has sold over 1 million pairs to date. They credit their massive success to creating the business one step at a time. I think a lot of times entrepreneurs get tripped up on, well, I need to raise capital. And I mean, you know, what's the long-term plan and world domination? And we always just say, just start small. Just start with whatever you have in front of you. And being unafraid to ask questions. To this day, I think people are annoyed with all of our questions. But at the same time, that's what's made us successful. I'm really excited about these. They feel like I, clouds. I know. We tried a pair here. So Bianca and Marissa told Jill they're, ho they're hoping to take birdies international. And they sent us each a pair of birdies. I have on, these are called the Game Changers. I love uh, Just those. part of their partnership with Angel City Football Club huh. with the goal of empowering women. I they like feel those. like you're walking on clouds. And they match and your outfit. They do. And then yeah. Dylan has this on the, the Falcon. The Falcon. I just Ooh. love these for ah! the fall. And it's they're like cute. you could slide these on with jeans and it, they're they're padded on the bottom, so they're just really comfy. They're a new design in the Roadrunner sneaker collection. What you can't see is that it feels like you're walking on clouds. I like, like these, the ones pillowy. in front here, too. I love that. Congratulations, ladies. Yeah. Jill always finds the most um, you know, fascinating entrepreneurs. Yeah. Thank Good you, stuff. Jill. Thank and you, I, Jill. now I feel like a princess. <laughs> Except, Sorry. To, except she's not one anymore. <laughs> Up next, Carlos and Alexa Pena Vega are here to talk about their new book. We're going to get an update on what's next for Big Time Ray. BTR, baby. <laughs> um, and then a little bit later, we've got the buzziest books of the month, including a love story that's going to hit the big screen next week. All that and more when the third hour of today rolls on. I like the rolls goal. dynamic duo. You know Carlos Pinavega is part of that that energetic boy band Big Time Rush and of course is what Alexa Pinavega she rose to fame as Carmen Cortez in the Spy Kids franchise. Well now now the couple is releasing their third book and it's titled Love is the Point 100 Days of God's Love for You and How to Share It with Those Around You and they are here this morning to tell us all about it. Carlos Alexa, welcome back. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Welcome back. You. you feel like a part of the family now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You are. So it's a, it, the book is a 100 and you've got a copy of it. Right here, yeah. It's a 100 day devotional. And there's a faith component to it, sure. but it's not just for people who are of faith. This is filled with stuff that everyone can do. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all love love. Mm -hmm. we all yes. love. And, and we all need to love, and, yes. and the world needs love. Yeah. You know, we were talking about how on social media, it's such a self-focused world nowadays because of social media, that the more we can help by giving back, the more we can focus on loving other people and serving other people, it's such a fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people feel this void right now in their lives is because when, you have, when you're so inner focused, you don't feel complete because that's not what we were called to do. We were mm -hmm. called to serve. And this book is just how to serve. We hear the phrase spread love and you talk about it in your book, but what does that really mean? Like when you're spreading love, how do you put spreading that into love. action realistically? <laughs> so many ways. So many. So we try and give you a hundred ways <laughs> to spread that love. For like one example, my sister, it, there was this season in her life where she didn't necessarily, necessarily have 
money okay. to give people. But she said she was driving down the side of the road and she passed this homeless guy and she just felt this pulling on her heart that she needed to go sit down and talk with him. Yes. Not just drive by him or give him a dollar yes. or whatever she <laughs> had. So she pulled over. She found a watermelon in the back of her car that she like purchased and a pocket knife. So she sat down with him and she cut the watermelon open and they sat there for an hour wow. just talking mm -hmm. about life and sharing this watermelon together. Wow. And that has stuck with me for years because it was such a powerful, simple moment. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can give back. It's yeah. not just money. It's not just like, you know, raising like all, all yeah. of this, these yeah. funds. Yeah. Yeah. It's, just it's just time, time. and yes. listening yeah. to what they have to say. Or as my pastor used to call it the ministry of presence. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I love that. I like that. Oh, that's gold. Mm -hmm. That's gold. And, and you guys both live, you live in Lahaina mm -hmm. and uh, yes. your house mm -hmm. was, was spared. But, what? you know, love is also being of service. And you guys have found a way to try to help those who were less fortunate. Yeah, I mean, guys. what what happened in Maui is just it's it's devastating. And we went back right after tour and just seeing everything and seeing the people. Our friends lost their homes, uh, and just it, it's 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 a really hard time. But what's been beautiful is seeing the community come together. The, the, the amount of people who are like, hey, listen, we can wait on people or we can do this ourselves right now. And everyone's coming together. They're they're you know uh, they're gathering showing supplies, up. showing up, um, and uh, and uh, so. We started a website, loveisthepoint.org, and it literally, we, 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 it, it has tons of families on there who are you verified, know, in, verified in need, and if you want to you know, go on there and help them directly through Venmo, PayPal, anything you can, and we also teamed up with, with a nonprofit so we can get people like, you know, who want those tax benefits can go in, and our thing is, let's just help these people out. Yeah. They need cars. They need, obviously, food and supplies, but they got to pay their mortgages, even though their houses aren't there. Yeah. Got to keep this thing it's going. Crazy. Yeah. So I mean, these these properties have been in their family for generations, right. and we don't want to see them lose that mm -hmm. because of this devastation. So we're just trying to find any way to keep the land in their hands. Oh, that's good. You guys are incredible. It's no wonder you have such a, a, a huge following. There were fans out here at 4:30 this morning waiting for you guys to get here. You just wrapped up. It's surreal. The big time rush <laughs> tour. There you guys oh, are. I wondered I mean, about like, that when I pulled up this morning. I'm like, who? Who's here? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, no, and, and you were so loving to all of them. The, those girls are incredible right there. Uh, so oh, she's crying. Big Time Rush just finished May. our tour, mm -hmm. and those girls showed up. I mean, I think probably 20, 30 shows. Really? really? Yeah. And yeah. it's just unreal. Other fans, your kids showed up at the at oh. all the shows. I mean, what's it like going on tour and traveling on a bus it's with your kids? It's incredible. It's incredible. You know, for Carlos, I'm sure he was exhausted every night, <laughs> but for us as a family, you know, it, our industry is very strange and unique, and often times you see families breaking apart in the mm -hmm. entertainment industry because you're pulled apart. Yeah. We decided early on, and it was something that my mother did with us growing up, was it didn't matter the project or where we were, we traveled as a family. Wow. They had like, we like it's all about having a mother and a father like really teaming up right. together to raise our kids. So I, You know, I thought she was my biggest fan right here, but my daughter has turned out Aww. to be my biggest fan. <laughs> she did, she Rio, took my place. Rio, every night, daddy sing, daddy, daddy sing, sing. Daddy, sing. Daddy, sing. Daddy, daddy sing. I was like, yes, for that you. That must be kind of cool. cool. That rock star <laughs> lifestyle, you know, everybody else is going out partying and you go back to the bus and change diapers. I change diapers. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And you wouldn't have it any other no, way. No, I love it. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's great. Oh. You guys are great. You're welcome here anytime, Carlos. Thank you guys. Thank you. Said, we love what you're doing. Uh, by the way, that new book we were talking about, Love is the Point, aptly titled, it's out right now. Love is the Point. I love that. All right, well, speaking of books, up next, it's time to snuggle up with a good read. Asik author Jessica Knoll, best known for her novel Luckiest Girl Alive, turned Netflix film, has her best picks for us. We'll go over that. And then later, meal prepping made easy. One pot of bolognese served two ways. That's great for your oh. entire family. We're going to show you how to do it. We'll be right back.
grab a pen or a pencil because it is National Read-A-Book Day and you are going to want to write down our list of this month's buzziest books. We have author Jessica Knoll who wrote the best-selling novels The Favorite Sister and Luckiest Girl Alive, which was adapted into a hit Netflix film starring Mila Kunis. She's coming out with a new thriller, by the way, Bright Young Women, coming out September 19th. Man. Congratulations for that. Oh, Talk about a busy <laughs> woman. Uh, like she's here to round up some of her favorite book picks. Welcome. Hey, Thank Jessica. you. Welcome and congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Happy to be here things. on National Book Day. I love that. Okay, so let's <laughs> jump right into the book recommendations. You're the thriller expert here. So let's talk about a new page turner that you want us to pick up. Yes. So just another missing person by Jillian McAllister. So Jillian McAllister wrote last summer's blockbuster, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited for her new one to come out. It does not disappoint. You think it's a story about a missing girl and the detective assigned to Ooh. investigate her case. But you quickly find out that the detective is hiding a dark family secret and that she is corruptible. Ooh. And so she is blackmailed into framing the wrong person. Oh, wow. Ooh. And the twists just keep coming. They don't okay. stop. Love the sound of yes. that. Okay. So, so well, you know what it's like to have a book turned into a movie. What's another a book that's into a movie that you like? Yes. The Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight, an excellent title. They shortened it slightly for the Netflix version that's coming out next week to Love at First Sight. Okay. It is starring Haley Lou Richardson, who I know oh, is a yeah. friend of yeah. the Today yeah. Show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people might remember her from the second season of White Lotus. Um, this is a super fast, super sweet read. Book fans are so excited to finally get this adaptation. Um, it's about two people who are seated next to each other on a seven hour flight from New York City to London who strike up a connection and mm -hmm. share a kiss. And then they oh, lose the track of each other once they get to Heathrow. And so they are determined to find one another because they believe them. Well, this is so weird because that happened to Chanel. I know, that's what? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 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 <laughs> it's a great premise. I, love that. Uh, I know we're into September now, but for those folks who still want just that one last easy beach read. Yes, yes. So The Sunset Crowd by Karen Tanaby. Oh, God, the cover's gorgeous. Yeah, it's it transports you back to 1970s Hollywood. It's like young Hollywood movies, and it's definitely inspired by The Great Gatsby. In fact, it mm. opens with a line from The Great Gatsby, but Tanaby has made all of the characters women. So mm. our Nick Carraway is B, who is a photographer, and she kind of captures the ins and outs of her cool crowd. And like The Great Gatsby, you can tell this is hurtling to kind of an inevitable end, and this does not disappoint, mm. but it's also a gorgeous mm. ride to get there. Hey. Jessica, this this next book for folks who like to read and laugh at the same time. Yes. You maintain this one made you laugh out loud. The Rachel Incident by Carolyn O'Donoghue. I can't remember the last time I laughed this hard at a book. And really? she's so clever and witty. Line by line, this is probably one of the best books I've read this year. Uh, Can I see that? Yes, yes. <laughs> Take it. You want to laugh out loud? Um, so Rachel is a young woman, just graduated college, and she takes a job at a bookstore, and she's instantly drawn to her her colleague James. James is gay. Rachel is straight. It's very Will and Grace. They mm -hmm. have this instant friend love at first sight kind of connection and they get up to no good together and it really just brings you back to those kind of intoxicating days of your 20s where mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out who you are but having so much fun in the process. Oh, love oh, that. I love Cheers that. to those days. Um, okay. <laughs> exactly. This wow. next book is fitting uh, the September, the September house. house. I loved this oh, one so dark. much. It's, it's, a dark? it's a ghost story but it's actually very humorous and very touching. Ultimately, it turns into a mother-daughter story and mm -hmm. it's about their relationship, but this house that they buy, every September, the walls bleed blood. Ooh. I mean, what else would you bleed but blood? But <laughs> they should um, move out. And the, they can't because it was too good of a deal and the house is gorgeous and we know what mortgage rates are right now. So they're <laughs> not moving out of this house. Wow. It's great. scary it's, to read. It's not really. It's yeah. cozy. It's okay. like a cozy Unless you're a painter. Mystery. Okay. Yeah. Cozy. <laughs> <laughs> Until every September, they go somewhere else. Yeah. I love it. So, Jessica, your latest novel, Bright Young Woman, Women, uh, it's inspired by some real life crimes committed by Ted Bundy. That's, mm. that's yes. a little dark. It is, but I think that it, like the title, there is kind of a bright, I, I take a bright point of view to this, and I wanted to highlight the women who I think history has forgotten. Mm. And um, I thought I knew everything there was to know about Ted Bundy and his crimes, and when I started researching it, I realized we don't know everything, and we really got the story wrong. Um, and I'm really drawn to, 
to kind of correcting the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I like to write. That's what I like to read. So um, hopefully you'll pick it up and you'll learn something new about the case. And, uh, you know, I hope that I've honored the, you know, the women who had, who, who did survive him and the women who did it. I can tell you're passionate about I'm it. I'm very yeah. passionate about That's it. Yeah. Jessica, thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. Again, Jessica's latest thriller, Bright Young Women, comes out September 19th. And if you would like to see her picks there on the table, just head to today.com slash books. All right. Coming up next on the third hour of today, our pal dietitian Vanessa Rosetto is here with a homemade sweet treat you do not want to miss. It's only got three ingredients. Oh. How simple is that? Third hour today, I'll be right back. Welcome back to Today Food. Returning to our routines this time of year can be a bit of a challenge, but we have you covered with some simple recipes, perfect for the whole family that you can make in no time. Here to help us prep two entrees and dessert, registered dietitian and CEO of Culina Health, Vanessa Rosetto. Good to Hi, see you. Vanessa. Welcome back, Vanessa. Hey, Lou, how are you? Oh. So, I'm so excited. I, yeah, what I love about this, you could use this for two different entrees. Yes, I think that we think of meal prep as like the same salad that we're gonna eat for 10 yes. straight days and that's not how life <laughs> really works. So right now I have two tablespoons of olive oil, I have carrots and I have celery, so that's cooking. We're gonna mm -hmm. add some onions, thank you. We're going to add garlic. Mm. I say three cloves, but really the thing about yeah. cooking is you do what you like. That's so, right. you know, if you want to add six cloves, please do that. You right? do you. Do you, boo. This is ground turkey. This is ground turkey. <laughs> Guys, ground turkey has no flavor, so we need to add flavorful things to the ground turkey. Right. Okay. So, here we're going to add oregano, mm -hmm. thyme, yep. allspice, and nutmeg. All of those are a quarter nice teaspoon. Flavors. Yeah, but nutmeg is an eighth of a teaspoon because it is a little bit powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to put that in. We're going to cook this until it's brown. We're also going to add a tablespoon a of tomato paste. Tomato paste. Mm -hmm. I'll you, it's uh, back to school time. This is perfect. It's perfect. It's very easy. It's a yes. good way for your kids, you know. This is such a good start for, I mean, anything. Yeah. You could literally put this That's in. Right. You can freeze it. We freeze it. We do extra so that we can make something for later. I'm also going to add a little bit of white wine. Mm, I'm going to uh, reduce right. that down. It's going to give it That's a little bit more. That's the white wine you don't drink. Yeah, you don't. No. Well, no, no, you, you want to put, use what you, you drink. know I'm saying, what's left after you've drank. Oh, right, uh, yes. You only want to cook with what yes. you would drink. Yes, And then, remember, we add the salt at the end because mm -hmm. the salt is the flavor enhancer, mm -hmm. okay. right? So it's going to bring out all the good flavors. And we're going to cook this ground turkey until it's brown. And then we're going to add a little bit of um, tomato sauce. And then we're Okay. do a little bit of stuffing. Stuffed peppers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I love a stuffed pepper. I love a stuffed pepper. Oh, Me you're too. here. You're, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. here. Okay, good. Yeah. You, gotta go. you haven't met free range Craig. I like <laughs> this. Okay, so we're going to get the stuffed pepper. By the way, when you have little kids, if you want to just cut in quarters, that okay. might compel them to eat more, right? Because oh, a big, because oh, a big pepper might be like overwhelming. So we're gonna peel this out, okay. right? Mm -hmm. and then just stuff it we're in gonna there. take this mixture. No, you and we're just gonna. That. This is so easy. I can do, do it. Like? You know, it's funny. I was at a shoot yesterday in um, yeah, where was I? In Birmingham, Alabama, and this lady comes up to me. She goes, "I love it when you guys eat." <laughs> Like, now, say are, you less. Gonna, are you gonna bake say this less. off now? We're gonna bake it off. Remember, this is already cooked. So right. what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a little bit of tomato mm. sauce, then we're gonna okay. put the stuffed peppers, and then we're gonna bake that for mm. 18 to 24 minutes in 425 degrees. Well, pepper will be done. done. Pepper will be done. Okay. okay. Why do you add that tomato sauce on the bottom? Because you just give it a little bit of a little, a little, little burn. burn. And then not burn, and it's also like gonna keep it nice sandwich. and 
um, crisp, now not how about soggy. Many pizzas you've got. Right. So when your yummy. kids don't want to eat your the vegetables that you put in front of them, <laughs> exactly. they're, they're not hard going to. Into them. Yeah, they're base they're not it, going yes. to do it. You're going to use that same base, that same right. extra. You can make. You get this cookie cutter, right? Mm -hmm. And you can fill. Oh, this is cute. Yep, and you can fill this muffin. What kind of what kind of dough did you get? You just got. You can get like a, you know, one pizza of those um, pizza doughs, or you, you know, whatever, you know, those what muffins, puff pastry, puff pastry, 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 whatever you like. Puff, okay. Any puff pastry, and so we do you. Do you? <laughs> this is cooking. Whatever makes you happy. Okay. And so we're gonna fill with our mixture that we made from this before. Is, mm -hmm. This is so flavorful. It's so good. Yeah, and then because we put all those spices. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then the salt at the end. <laughs> and so, and you're gonna fill this up. You are going to bake it for 18 to 24 minutes at 325. Okay. And you're also gonna add a little bit of cheese, whatever cheese you like. This is mozzarella, but you can have Parmesan. And this then, is even that's gonna be yummy. To throw these into the lunch box. Oh. Here you go, my friend. Oh, thank you I know you're gonna love it. Now tell it's us yummy. about this uh, the simple this easy dessert. It's three mm -hmm. ingredients. Chocolate chips, coconut butter, maple syrup. Really? You really? put it in silicone trays, you put it in the freezer, and then every time you want one, you pop it out. It's really great. Also, like at night, it takes a long time for you mm -hmm. to eat it. If you want, you can also add peanut butter. So you could do peanut butter to the base, and then you have a peanut butter chocolate cup. You're it's a dietitian, really... so I feel like mm, I'm trusting you here. So yes. we, don't, it's like, guilt, we don't have to feel guilty but about yeah, this one. This you... almost tastes like a pizza bite, by it the way. Does. It does. Yeah, yeah this is delicious. Like a... Except you've filled it with healthy, Good stuff. delicious things. Mm -hmm. and, and there's all the hidden happy. vegetables in there, too. So. Your kids are happy. Mm -hmm. and Everybody's you, happy. Everybody's happy. Win, win. And you didn't actually make two different meals. No. That's true. That's great. Good. Vanessa, delicious. thank you so much. Yeah. Delicious. delicious. I know. I make hey, delicious for these food. Recipes. Only delicious food <laughs> I make. Delicious. Yes. Yes. Guilt-free. Yes, you can, you can trust me. Eat yeah, the food thank that I make. For these recipes, <laughs> head to today.com slash food. And thanks to our sponsor, Instacart, for providing the ingredients for this segment. Yep. For a limited time, Instacart's offering new customers 50% off on an Instacart Plus membership for the first year. And don't forget to join us on September 18th. Mark your calendars. It's our Start Today meal prep event. It's sponsored by Instacart. It's all virtual so anyone can attend. Just scan the QR code on the screen right now to get your tickets. And we'll be right back. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Speaker Jay Shetty joins us to talk about his eight rules of love, how to find it, keep it, or just let it go. Let's say love one more time. Love. <laughs> uh, up next on Hoda and Jenna, we're going to catch up with actor Christopher Maloney, one of our nice. favorites. That's right. Did you ever read the book, The Love Monster? I have not. Have a great Wednesday. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Get back. Here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, you deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Y'all yeah. love Al Roker. <laughs> One of our favorites, actor Christopher Maloney, stops by. Plus, two couples hash it out in relationship court with Devin Simone. And the hottest Hollywood couples news and more. Our pal Justin Sylvester's got the scoop. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Center, it's today. 
with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So good. All right, let's go. Hi, guys. It is Wednesday. It's September the 6th. Our sh set is still shiny. We were Windexing it, making shiny everything all new. ready. Because it's all new. Everything's fresh. Fresh, fresh, fresh. Back it's a fresh new day. School. It's Everything is a reset. I love what you said yesterday about how January doesn't need to be the only reset month. No. September is a reset month. It we is. can do it again and again. Mm -hmm. It's so fun to think about a new season yeah. as a new start. Yep. It's really how was fun. first day of school? Oh, today was her first day. I was so excited. Um, so I left the set at 730, and I live about 20 minutes from 30 Rock. Yeah. So I zipped home. Got my kids their, their backpacks. They were all ready. They were sh busting. Haley's going into first and Hopi's going into pre-K. And they go to the same school. For so, the first time. For the first well, time together. In a long time. Ah! Was that the picture that's this the picture. morning? Yes, that's from just now. Anyway, it was so fun. There's Joel and me. And uh, we didn't get all of Hope there, but she's there. Anyway, <laughs> it was such a fun day. And this first day of school can be scary. Haley just went sprinting off with their friends. It was like, bye. And we were, you know, we were yeah. like, well, okay, have a great day. She was gone, just but dust. But doesn't that make you kind of proud? Yes. You've done your yes. job. And Hopi's first day in a new school, and she was great. She just kind of started playing with some people. And then, you know, that they do a phase in so she stayed for about an hour but yeah. anyway I got to tell you the first day of school the new outfit the fresh backpack the new just beginnings yeah so shiny um, and happy today is my kids first day too <gasps> okay Mila set her alarm wait to what how herself wait, for what? 640 she told me she wait, said I okay. set my own alarm we I, I couldn't be there but I FaceTime okay. yeah and I, she set her alarm she got puppy dressed wait. they picked out their outfits last night laid them out and we, I got the picture of them all on the front porch. <laughs> Hal has his first day. He took his biggie. Wait, what's Hal's? Where's he going? He's in nursery? preschool. Pre yeah. yeah. He took it, whatever. I don't know. I know. I know. I feel like Hope's already been in pre-K, but she's in it again. It's preschool. <laughs> just goes on and on and on. I know. And when on. they said, what, what year's your daughter? I go, well, she was in pre-K last year. And they go, she's back in pre-K. I was like, okay. Well, it's Hal's thing is called connecting. So I sent a picture okay. to my parents. And my mom is like, mean? what is connecting? I'm like, it's another word for preschool. Okay, got it. There's a million words. Okay, so he started. He and started. How, did, how are all your kids kind of independent? I feel like you raise independent yeah. kids. Yeah, I mean, I think when you yeah. can't be there, they kind of have to be. Yeah. You and know? I, yeah, and I do think, but even with or without you yeah. there, like, I feel like your kids are adjust, they adjust when they have yeah. to be somewhere. They do. And I like, you know, I left them little notes. I did all the things. But anyway, first day. There's nothing sweeter. I know. I'll I show you pictures. Okay, good. I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, okay. okay, so there was some couple news overnight, I'm mm -hmm. sure yeah. y'all have read. Um, Joe Jonas filed divorce from Sophie Turner, saying the marriage is irrevocable. Irrevocable. You know what I mean. Is that spelled irrevocably? In, yeah, that's spelled in, anyway, I don't know. It's broken. What? No, that's not it. Okay. <laughs> it's broken. Um, okay. Okay, anyway, um, so that's the end of uh, yeah. marriage. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah. And then also Kyle, Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chamele, they took the Chalamet. relationship. Chalamet, can we, we speak? Can't. Today's not our day to speak. It's also our you know first what? day of school. We're still learning prompter. Hooked words. on phonics did not work for me. <laughs> but they did take their relationships to the next level. At the because, Beyonce concert. Let me tell you. You know, sometimes when you're at a concert, oh, yeah. the music's playing, oh, yeah. you think nobody can see you totally. because you're just vibing and you don't even, and you know what else? You don't even care if yeah. people see you. There's, because, uh, isn't it so true how concerts bring out some yes. PDA in people? Yes, because you don't, for some reason you just, that's when you're free. Yeah. Like that's when you're free. Totally. When you're not Music. buttoned up and worried. I'm glad. Yeah. yeah. And so anyway, they made out. Is it young love? Young, there's something about that, about when you don't, when you're just in love and you're happy. And it's like the person we like doesn't know your shadows, doesn't know the yes. dark parts, just sees like happy, shiny. And even though that's not real, yeah. it's fun to have it for a while. It's like adrenaline feeling. Yes. I, I remember, and I've like, I'd said this to Henry, the, fir when, the first winter that we fell in love, yeah. it was the first winter I did not live in Texas, so yeah. it was I lived in Washington. Right. It was cold. Yeah. I don't remember it being cold. You don't remember that. 
I don't remember you cold. Were I was never cold. Making out. No, yes, it wasn't making you, out. you don't have to <laughs> yes. take it that way. I just remember feeling warm inside loved. and feeling loved. loved. Yeah, yeah. And really, it was freezing outside, but it was there was something about it. But they do say that sometimes, like, because of the way social media is, things get accelerated, like relationships. It sort quickly. of makes me sad that our kids yeah. won't have that longing feeling. Remember Waiting. that feeling? when yeah. we were in college yeah. and you'd be like, I wonder where he is. And you wouldn't know. I wonder know. if he will call me. Yeah. I wonder. If I'll see him. If I'll see out. him. <gasps> and when you did see him, it was a surprise. You didn't know totally. because you didn't see it on social media and run over to that bar. Oh, is that what people do these days? Probably. Yeah. They do? But yeah, I like the longing. Can we go back to that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me about that. Well, I just think it's like, there's something about it. I, my parents got married after three months of meeting each other. And my- did they live in the same city? They did not live in the same wow. city. My mom was a librarian in yeah. Austin. Yeah. My dad lived in Midland. Okay. And he went on vacation to yeah. see his parents. Oh, cute. 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 Went on vacation to see his parents and called back home to oh, see where, she called my mom. Was. Yeah. And she, and her, I guess her roommate, or maybe she said, I'm going out with, you know, somebody, I've got to go. And he immediately flew to Austin. Because he couldn't plane. bear the fact that she had a could, date. Because he, she was doing something else, and I mean, he <gasps> was crazy about her. So I think that sort of like, instead of just looking online to see what was happening. I know. You know what? There is something about romance, and it makes it last yes. when there's something like that. And I wonder if you can. I mean, I you still can have romance without the. Yeah, rest, but we but have to make sure that people like know how to talk to each other. I know. Instead of just text yes. each other, you up. <laughs> you know? Why do they just say you up? You up, question marks. can they, like, learn how to look in each other's eyes? You up. You up. That's good. All <laughs> okay. right. So Ethan Hawke and his daughter Maya are on the cover of Variety magazine. Oh. How cute, by okay, the way. Okay, so Maya, who was in Stranger Things, yeah. she's an incredible actress. She now stars in the upcoming film Wildcat, which was directed by her dad. Now we know her mom is Uma Thurman. So there's an interview where Maya recalls a time when Ethan was caught by the paparazzi Flirting with a celebrity. Oh, no. Okay. okay, let's see. I've been caught by the paparazzi openly flirting with Rihanna, and that's openly been a huge... Openly trying to. Uh, yeah, uh, trying to <laughs> flirt. And so, so that's been to, to the family shame. So you're really touching a nerve. No, it's family no, pride. <laughs> family pride. The best is that his son is sitting next to him. So he was, like, trying to flirt. He had that casual, like, Like, leaned Avery. back. Yeah. Look, way yeah. back. As if... As if. <laughs> As if. But you know what? Plus, when you lean no, back. I know. Le that's not. No, that's to me, not, that's flirting not flirting. Flirting isn't this. Lean flirting in. is this. Lean in. This is flirting. This. That's this you. Is too I'm cool. sorry. That's you up energy. That's you up energy. <laughs> Let's get. Lean, lean in. in. If you're going to flirt, do it. You know how you do. I actually had a boyfriend once who came to meet my mom, and he sat like this for the <gasps> entire lunch. Back was your like mom this. Horrified? I mean, she didn't say anything because she's that was lovely. Over. But had I been my mom? Yeah, you would have said, "Sit up, sit up, and pay attention." Because I think it's good for for grownups to call out teenagers. Bad behavior. Yes, Maria Shriver does it. She tells me that she does it. If someone doesn't write a thank you note, she calls up the kid and says, "Hey, you know what? I just want to say something just for the future, okay? Just so you can plant this seed. We went on vacation with you. I did not hear from you, okay?" So I just want you to know that. <laughs> but sometimes you got to call out. This like, is not. This is not respectful. No, that's we, not how someone talks the to your you mother. The you up energy has to end, and I feel yes. like if there's one person that can stop Who? it, it's Maria Shriver. She can. <laughs> by the way, she can shut it down. Sit there will up. be no. She. By the way, she told me this when she walks in a room, her kids and her kids' friends stand up. Stand up. Oh, stand up. By because the way, she would never allow somebody to sit back like ever. that. Ever. She'd be like, the, sit up if you're going to speak with me. Yeah. And, and, she, and then she'd talk to them. She wouldn't be like, no, and. rude. She would just be, nope, we don't speak that way. Now, what do you want to tell me? Like, ooh. Okay, let's turn into that. I like it. All right, coming up, the latest on Joe and Sophie, Kylie, and Timothy, all the celebs, big couples making news yeah, today. Our guy, Justin Sylvester, has the scoop and more right after this.
It is time to get you caught up on all the hot Hollywood headlines. Yeah, East Justin Sylvester is back in L.A. with all the scoop. Hi, Justin. Hi, Justin. Good morning. Okay, first of all, this is really all about you. It you sure had a is. huge weekend. You were at the concert of the century. You guys, I'm telling you right now, I had so much fun. I think I might have tore my ACL, my MCL, my BBL, my ACT. Oh my it God. was the night of all nights. It was so crazy. The lady next to me actually went into labor and stayed. Wait, no, she did not. Is that, did the, you make that there's up? There's a Are girl you who went into labor. I'm not joking. She went into labor. Her husband asked her if she wanted to leave, and she said, I am not going to miss this. Beyonce. That's how much fun people were having. And I'm telling you, I paid $7.50 for the ticket. I would have did that just for the hair flips alone. Okay? Holy moly. So you got to see the birthday serenade and everything? I got to see Diana Ross. I got to see Kendrick Lamar. But what was the best part of the whole show was that it was the cookout that everyone wanted to be at. <laughs> yeah. Kerry Washington was there. You had Katy Perry and Kate Hudson sitting in a seat together. Zendaya brought her man Tom Holland. Storm Reid, everyone was in attendance. Chris Jenner went three nights in a row. That's how crazy the wow. show was. What? Um, and, yes. Now, and were there any couples spotted? New couples? We may have already discussed this, but let's plan. Y'all discussed this, but let me tell y'all something. I saw the Kylie Timothy Chalamet thing in person, but you know TMZ yeah. released these photos. But I'm telling y'all, that wasn't just a makeout because after they were finished, I almost got the paramedics. I thought she needed some breath because <laughs> they were going at it. They were into each other. And like you said, Hoda, they were just in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, another couple yes. that's making headlines is Kiki and her baby daddy, mm. Darius. Okay? Now, I don't want to speculate, but they looked booed up at the concert. They were having a good time. And I think, personally, this might be, you know, her letting us know that she might be back with her man. Do you think they really broke up? Maybe that was just yeah. not a real breakup. What do you think? No, I actually think they really broke up. Oh, okay. I don't think they broke up for as long as we did, mm -hmm. but I think they had went through it. And I think, you know, it's growing pains. I think anybody who has a kid knows, whether you're famous mm -hmm. or not, yeah, it's that a lot. first few months, that first year, is a lot of change. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And we and we discussed earlier on the show the mm -hmm. sad news, too, about Sophie Turner and Joe Jonas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know... There were rumors that were swirling. There was a lot of speculation. He didn't have his ring on. They might be getting divorced. Well, the two of them put out a statement together, and it says, after four wonderful years of marriage, we have mutually decided to end our marriage. There are many speculative narratives as to why, but truly, this is a united decision, and we sincerely hope that everyone can respect our wishes for privacy for us and our children. Now... You know, when people don't put out statements, the rumors start flying, everyone goes everywhere. So it was really nice that they put this out. They're putting on a united front, and we're like, you know, rooting for them that they can get through this. All right. And wait, is there, you got a little bit more couples news? Did someone make news on Insta? You guys. But, okay, ooh. so y'all know how I told y'all Irina Shayk and Tom oh, Brady yeah. may be dating. Yeah. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, Irina went on vacation. And she posted a bunch of thirst traps, but she also <laughs> included a photo of Bradley Cooper, huh? who's the father of her kid on this vacation. Ooh. Now, oh. I'm a Scorpio, so I play more games than The Price is Right. And I know her play right here, okay? Because my grandmother used to tell me, ladies, get closer. Uh -huh. <laughs> my grandmother would tell me that a man won't seal the deal unless he thinks he might lose it. Ooh. So if you want to make him jealous or make him seal the deal faster, you show up with another fish to catch that fish. Mm -hmm. oh, I think trick Irina, in the book. Oh, this trick in the book. Mm -hmm. I think Irina said, you know what? I have the hottest baby daddy out here. He got two Oscars coming in these photos. <laughs> We're going to make this man jealous. And I think this might be a little play. So oh. Tom Brady not the only one calling plays on the field now. Well, let's oh, see. Wow. Justin, okay, Justin, thank, thank you. you. All right, you can catch our pal Justin on our sister network E weeknights at 11 p.m. Okay, we've got another big name celeb making news. It's Christopher Maloney. From his naughty viral <laughs> commercials to his latest passion project for catch up with him after this. <laughs>
We all know and we love Chris Maloney, Christopher Maloney, for his many roles in TV and film. Yeah, and now he's stepping into an important new role for a good cause. Oh, huh. We're so happy so you're here. here, Christopher. Oh, Thank you for having me. Okay, we were just talking. You <sighs> dropped your empty nester. We just took our kids to school today. Day one. Yeah, how old? How old? We well, I got a six and a four. I have a ten. A eight and a four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're youngsters. So your last child has yeah. now gone off to college. What was yeah. that like? Uh, you know, you 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 take the steps necessary, oh. and everything is great. And then you know you get home and just the, you feel as though you hear the wind whistling through the hallway, <laughs> tumbleweeds. I mean, it's there's an emptiness. And anyway, uh, it's, <laughs> it's tough. I'm I'm dealing with it right now. I know yeah, we are. can see it. Like it's yeah. a real thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. And I so what's but you and your wife are that there must be some upsides to it too. Absolutely. You know what it is. Honestly, every night has the potential to be date night. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, and it's you get you really do you get a little closer and you walk a little closer yeah. and slower. So that, that's how nice. long have you guys been married, you and your wife? Uh, it was ninety five. So wow. help me do the math. Wow. <laughs> And what what is it about her? I mean, these are beautiful pictures, uh, and we see it. Well, you know, she. What has been great is the the longer you're married, and you go through all the things yeah. that you know you go through as a married couple, and if you can uh, tough it out, and you can find the reasons why yeah. you you love them, and you were attracted to them in the first place and, and, and those just grow and those uh, uh, feelings and those strengths of the other person solidify. Mm -hmm. it, it's so funny. It's I feel like mm -hmm. the length has something to do with it. Like when we watch you and um, mm -hmm. and your show and with Mariska, mm -hmm. everybody loves that because you yeah. all have had this staying power. We just yeah. want love. You're rooting, that's, you're rooting for love. That's you're, love. Yeah. You know, rooting for love, but also rooting for the, yeah. the togetherness yeah. of something yeah. that can last. Well, you know, I think I, I, I think yeah. people look at it and go. Oh, they're, they're having all these tough times, or you know, all these dramatic moments that we play out yeah. and we dramatize. But in real life, it's, you're not dramatizing. It's you have to go, you have to stick it out through the tough times. Yeah. If you come out the other end and go, oh, that's, this that's is why we doing. are what we are. Yeah. Well, then, you're known for that. You're also known for your super sexy commercials that you like to do. Remember we the discussed, Peloton one? We discussed it. The naked one. We had to are discuss you, it. Are you, by the way, <laughs> we couldn't. We just kept playing it. Well, we couldn't. What are you doing? First of all, did is you, that real? No, you, that you had on Mondays. Well, like, what, yeah. what part of real are you hoping to <laughs> well, that, that was real. That, that really was real. Are you, by the way, are you a naked person? Some people wow. are naked around their house. They're just comfortable being naked. <laughs> Are you? Yes. You are. I, we knew it. Yes. We figured. Well, and we also, do you, you really do work out like that, like always? No. Yeah. You, oh, you don't, oh work out, you don't work out naked. Yeah, yeah, that was what the whole oh, thing was. No, no do no. I actually work out naked? Yeah. Well, yeah. remember, that was the thing. Yes, that's what started that. I lit the fuse. Look, I was doing a long line of interviews where you go from one person to the next, yeah. and they, you know, you they, ask you the out. they ask you the same, same questions, questions, and I just wanted to spice it up. And then, is that you know, what you did? Yeah, I spiced it up. But don't you think? Is it real? Know. Is it re So you don't really work out naked? No. no. Okay. Oh, that would be weird. No. Is that disappointment or relief? He said, that's what we talked about on the show. He said he worked out but naked. But he just said he was trying to spice up interviews. Okay. Well, well that's what yeah, we, we do. Yeah, we are a little disappointed. We are. <laughs> honestly, You're we very difficult to please. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they say about us. Wait, what it. does your wife think about the fact that you did this naked Peloton? <laughs> Oh, she loved it. She Did loved it. You know, she, you know she, she knows good humor when she sees it. She, it is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She can take a joke. Um, you also are connected to a very, very important cause, yeah. which yeah. is one of the reasons why you came here. Yeah. Lyme disease is something yes. that it, it's been around for a long, long time. It took doctors so long to even diagnose, but it's important to you. Yeah, the Global Lyme Alliance, they're there to help with research and, mm -hmm. and uh, getting the word out, awareness. Um, you know, uh, many people don't understand uh, mm -hmm. Lyme. Uh, many medical professionals are just now almost getting up to speed. Mm -hmm. It's a very tricky, difficult disease to diagnose. Yeah. Uh, it's even more difficult to treat. Yes. In fact, the CDC says their official line is, you know, a uh, regimen of 10 to 21 days worth of antibiotics will, will knock it out. And that in, that's not true. Mm -mm. There is such a condition as chronic Lyme. If you don't catch it, uh, in the first stages and you don't treat it, then you can get chronic Lyme and that stays with you and that is an unpleasant journey.
Yeah. I know firsthand. Well, and yeah. and there is there is um, some hope that there's they're close to doing more research, which I know is really important too. Y yeah, and and I, I keep hearing the, yeah. the teaser that they're on the cusp of a, a vaccine, vaccine, and fantastic. But if you already have the disease, mm. well, you know yeah. that's. I mean, God bless America and everyone who can get the vaccine, uh, if you believe in the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I hope you do, and you should. Yeah. Uh, but there still needs to be a lot of research for people that are suffering today. Yeah, sure. that's true. Thank you, All thank right. you, Christopher. Will you, will you hang around? Yeah. Okay. I will hang around. Oh, good. Okay, because okay, we remember when you bared it all for an ad. We're not we're letting really... it go. We're like a dog with a no, bone. No, we are, we're told you worked out naked, okay. and we are disappointed. Okay, okay. okay. hold on. What else? Oh, jeez. <laughs> we're going to find out what else he's willing to do to sell a product right after this. <laughs> Maloney has so many talents. One of them is he stars in a bunch of commercials and he's got a skill that he demonstrated. We're going to show this piece of video until we can't show no, it, it no more. Never, it that will never not Peloton be shown. Ad. Um, with this specific strength in mind, we thought we'd put Christopher to a test in a game we're calling Can Christopher Sell It? it? All right. So um, we are going to give you a couple of products. Yep and see if you would feel comfortable selling them in only the way you can. Okay. Wait, you have a, what makes a good commercial? Do you have any sort of prior history in knowing what works? No clothes really works. <laughs> okay, well then, let's try. Let's, uh, all right, we're going to start off with our first item. We're going to put 20 seconds on the clock. All right, and here is your first item, Christopher. It, oh, oven mitts. Oven mitts. Go. Okay. Oh, there's a kitchen behind you. Ah, uh, bright red so that your hands don't get bright red. <laughs> and just in case you have some muffins in the oven, there you are, they come out. If you're a swimmer, they also help you get through the water so much quicker and smoother. Uh -huh. And if your feet are slim and shiny, wow. you get of, right there. Buying? Mm. Are we buying? Mm. Yeah, we mm. buy what we uh, I don't know, I don't know. We okay, great, sell. good. All right, okay. next up, 20 seconds on the clock. Next, we've got... An exercise band. Okay. Oh, this is you. Hit it. All right. And go. So, <laughs> if you ever felt like you wanted to have your inner Bruce Lee come out, these yes. are the bands for you. If wow. you want to extend your deltoids, which are behind there, or you just want to get your biceps rolling, there you are. Yes. Or if you want to stretch out. Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. You know, guys, I need 30 seconds. This ain't right. <laughs> I, I, I was almost on the cusp. Well, all right, we've got one last one we're for you. This. And then we're all that we bought these two yeah, already. We're buying everything. And we've so. got a oh. pool noodle, one or two. Oh, two. Would you like two? both? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. all right, hit it. 20 seconds. Go. The patented Maloney noodles aren't just for swimming, although safety is important. But now, with our new edible styrofoam. <laughs> There's no more waiting 20 seconds after you eat to get into the pool. Oh my God. Yes. Christopher, you really there. should start 
to sell some stuff. Yeah. Billy Mays. <laughs> Amazing. By the way, you're 2.0. an awesome human being. Yeah, thank, thank you for coming you. to see Thanks us. Thanks for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Okay, coming up next, y'all, all rise. Relationship court is being called to order. The Honorable Devin Simone lays down the law. Coming up after this. Thank you. Okay, got a dispute with, you, with your significant other? Guess what? We're here to help. It's time for Oda and Jenna's Relationship Court. And presiding as queen of the courtroom, dating expert and matchmaker, Devin Simone. Okay, hi, Devin. Okay, here's how it's going to work. We've got some folks here who have a disagreement in their relationship. Each person will present their side of the argument, and Devin will issue a final ruling. Devin, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. All right, Lee, tell us about our first case. It's the case of the travel troubles. Lulu and Josiah have been dating for six years. They love taking special trips together, but don't see eye to eye on how exactly to unplug. Oh, I see, I okay. see. All right, you guys are each gonna have 20 seconds to make your case, okay? Lulu, you go first. So Josiah doesn't know how to relax. We're on vacation, we're at the beach, and he's still working. He's still answering emails, writing scripts. He's a content creator, and he doesn't know how to relax. I'm trying to relax, and he's there working. I'm like, boy, just lay down and relax. We're on vacation. <laughs> so it stresses you out. Okay, okay, Josiah, now you've got 20 seconds to make your working case. So laying on a beach and not doing anything isn't really fun for me. I need something active to do to like entertain me, keep me stimulated. So the only time I would do work on a vacation is when she's laying down, reading her book, tanning, whatever, and I need something to kind of keep me having fun. So I would do work then, and it helps me not be stressed when I get back home to this huge pile of work. All right. Um, okay. Well, I guess yeah. should we have some follow-up questions. Lulu, if you're doing your own thing, like reading, does it just distract you with him working? Why does it bother you? Well, when I'm relaxing, I get stressed because I know that later on, he's going to tell me he's tired. He's going to tell me he's anxious. He's going to tell me he's stressed because in the moments that he was supposed to be relaxing and letting go, he's still working. Yeah, he's stressing right now. I can see it. Okay. Yeah. Was, uh, wait, is there any way you could unplug and feel um, relaxed about I, it? I do feel relaxed when I stay busy. So, like, when I have activities to do and I'm having fun, time away from work, I'm unplugged, but I'm doing something. If I'm laying down, staring right, at the beach, fun. that's, I'm stressed. Okay, now yeah. we need we need Devin's insight. So look, that's fair. Some people are just not conditioned to be able to just chill and sit and do nothing. They've always gotta be go, go, go. However, doing the little things together is actual connection. And it sounds like, Josiah, you're stressing her out on her vacation <laughs> because she knows that you're gonna be stressed because you didn't actually vacate and not do anything. <laughs> so talk about it beforehand, carve out some time before you go on that trip of like, hey, we have do whatever we want time, which maybe means you're reading a book on the beach and he's working or content creating and you're also going to have some together time even if it means playing cards or talking yeah. while outside enjoying the space ultimately though i'm ruling in favor of lulu okay okay but, that, but that was also a compromise yeah right i was gonna say y'all should start a book club or play spades <laughs> yeah. y'all should That's, read the same yeah. book and 
and you yeah. can discuss it. That's true, actually. Does that sound fun? Yeah. I don't read books. Oh, <laughs> I don't read something, books. Something, though, yeah. Wow. Read something. Okay. Okay, I voted. The wrong? I'm in charge. Lulu for the win. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Lulu, thanks, Josiah. Okay, case number two, tell us what we got. It's the case of the dining dilemma. Chani and Ben have been together for more than five years. They love going out to eat with friends, but disagree on how to dish out the leftovers. Dishing out the leftovers. Okay, Vin and Shani, you each have 20 seconds to make your case. Vin, let's put 20 seconds on the clock. You will go first. Let's go. Your honors, my beautiful <laughs> girlfriend and I, we love to go out to eat with friends and other people. Oftentimes, she'll have a little bit left over on her plate or her portion. And all I would love is for her to offer it to me before she gives it away to everybody else <laughs> and gives me an opportunity because you take care of your family first. Oh, oh. okay. So it's pronounced Shani? Shani. Shani. Shani, okay. You have 20 seconds to rebuke. Go. I admit I do this, but my intention is not to um, neglect him of his desire for food or to not be loyal. Um, and I feel like it's a big part of my culture to extend kindness and extra consideration to the people or like the guests in front of me. And I would love for him to be a part of that with me. Mm. Y'all are so lovely. That is sweet. Okay, we do have a couple of follow-up questions. Yeah. Okay, Vin. Okay, so could you jump in and say, hey, honey, do you mind if I have that last rib <laughs> on your plate? Could you just ask for it instead of waiting to see, is she going to offer it to me? So I would, I definitely agree with that. The thing is, is that she'll just take it and give it to someone. She'll be like, I'm not going to eat this rib. You have it. And then what am I going to be like, whoa. Wait, you, that you was my that. rib. Yeah, then, then I look pretty bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, could you start with Ven? Could you say, here's my rib. Yes. You try it first, and then if he says, no, thank you, I'm not interested? He'll never say no. <laughs> he will never say no. You know, I might still be he'll hungry. never say no, and so I'll never have the opportunity to do Share that kind others. gesture. So you like to do a kindness to other people who are just there with you, and do they often take the yeah, rib? Yeah, I'm so grateful. They, They're like, oh my gosh, are you sure? Are like, you sure? I, thank you. Oh. And to me, that, that that brings me joy, and I think it's something that. Oh, this is a hard to, one. There's a lot to unpack. I mean, can, can we order more food? Yeah. <laughs> Question. So then, good quite, good so then Ben feels fulfilled, but also we can share it with others. If that's okay. not an option, then it's wonderful, and I'm, I'm sure it makes you a wonderful friend and a hostess to be able that you're so giving and thoughtful of other people. But it's easy to slip into um, the pattern of forgetting your partner's needs because you start to feel comfortable with them. You know, they love you. You love them. So you're catering to everyone else. And and in order to maintain a really strong and healthy relationship, you want to be mindful of their needs. It should be a priority. So if Ben wants that rib, you are still going to be an amazing host. Your friends are going to love you. And if he's the one that's eating everything, his friends will still love him. But it's important to, to offer it to him as well. So I'm really in favor of Vincent. Oh. All right, guys. Th by the way, thanks to both of our couples. That was yeah. fun. Devin, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Got a good touch. All right, it's football season. Are you ready to party at the next big game? Yeah, we've got all your tailgate essentials lined up right after this.
swing, and the NFL kicks off tomorrow night right here on NBC with last season Super Bowl champs. Of course, we're talking about the Kansas City Chiefs taking on the Detroit Lions. So here with the tailgate essentials that are sure to score a touchdown with your team is the author of Well Played, Meredith Sinclair. Let's Hi, go, Meredith. girl. It's are you time. Ready for some football? Right. Oh, are you a big Steelers fan? <laughs> of course. My hometown. Come on. Awesome. Awesome. Do it. All right. So, Everyone loves a tailgate. Yes. Great, we got you hooked up. This first thing is so what cool. Is this? this is called the tail table. What? This hooks right onto the back of your car with, okay. your, with your little U hook on the back of your trunk. And it all, there's a cutting board. Wow, in. this is a there's, great. Get. I know. It's a whole setup. So you wait, can do your it whole legs spread. So no, it just, it just, Look at wait, that. It right see. off oh. the back of your trunk. Oh. And you've got your own table. And then it all breaks down so you can put it all into the Look, dishwasher. Look, you can put cups here. The wine yes, glass so holders. wine glass holders. Wine glasses. And it all breaks down for the dishwasher. Okay. And then, Brilliant. speaking of great cups, right, why go with plain plastic cups when yeah. you can have fun? So these are all from Packed Party, and they and all have, time. like, you know, football themes, and then our little football sippers. Oh, those are so cute So you can have can your be. water or whatever drink that you would like. These, these you know, they're all dishwasher they're safe. They're cute and as can be. Okay, I love an organized tailgate, so you can pick up one thing and go. Okay, so this is a caddy yeah. that we found on Amazon. There's a little cooler in here. Wow, that's it awesome. Your, look, this is my favorite part. Wait, a roll of paper. I know, because I'm always throwing rims. those in the back of the trunk. Yes. Wait, and this your is plates. great. Even, I know we're talking tailgating, yeah. but like for anything. Yes. Picnic, Camp, or picnic soccer games or with your mm -hmm. grilling. Grilling. Look all of for it. some it all your tools. Yes. Yeah, so this is a great little caddy. You can find it on Amazon. Really fun. Brilliant. Again, it has the cooler like, and everything set in. Wait, okay, now. Oh, oh, yes. awesome. Everything. Look, this Girl. is the cooler. I know. It's all done in one this and done. This is brilliant. And then if you want a high-tech cooler, this is so wow. sick. This is from Works. It's an electric-powered cooler. No ice needed. So you Wait, can charge what? it either with batteries like that are Look in here, that big or thing. you can plug it into an outlet, or you can charge it with your car charger. So this has, so no, this has ice. no ice. You keeps, open it up. Yep. Oh, sorry, you keeps, go. That's no, right. Keeps everything cold. It, it goes down to, and we, we just, we just These put these in here. These are cold. Well, you, they, it goes down to 32 degrees in 15 minutes. So everything's, I know, and it has a funky, like, control panel here so you can monitor it's your temperature. Water. I have an addiction. Yeah, 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 I do. That's great. I'm so, getting over it. This but, is a bit yeah. of a splurge, but right now they're doing a discount for oh, wait, us, 25% okay, off. That's the battery, so that's it. And it, care, it holds how many, like a couple of? Oh, I mean, look, look there's, like, Let's tons see. in here, I tons of cans. That's all right, that's all right. Tons of cans or whatever oh, else you yeah. want to hold oh, in there. Yeah. But again, down to 32 degrees in 15 minutes. Without ice. Without ice. Okay, okay. Now, portable, you got to have a grill for your tailgate, right? But it's a portable grill grill and it even has a carrying case and ta-da and a little a push button it's ignite so cute. how do you stand you, you it do up it, you 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 attach it, it right the... to with um with to propane like you would do any okay. grill okay. and then you you stand it up here and then <laughs> then this what i'd love to easy okay. cleanup this goes right into the dishwasher and then you can carry it oh, so does it just sit on big. the floor and, and the... it's a gas you know okay. it's a gas one but, so wait, wait where do you put it you can put this on the ground yeah yeah or on a table if you have a table you know right okay 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 oh my god we love Cornhole is the best team. game. This is you your, need that safe. Yeah, you're over here. You're Here's over here. what's special Bye. about these. These okay, are talk to LED us about. cornhole. Wait, what? So you can do this as the sun goes down, play away. It um, it folds oh. right down. The legs fold right down. There we you go. Know, and this no, from, I just knocked myself This off. is from NFL Shop. Oh, baby. Bam, I did too. <laughs> and you they have two. Yeah, me too. All your teams How are much represented. Are so okay, two really in. I don't want to show off. This is, I know, keep going. From NFLshop.com, any team you want. Want. Of course, oh, I'm no. a Steelers fan. Oops. Now living in LA, which is a little tricky, but Steelers fans are everywhere. Okay, you won. By the way, okay. <laughs> how Congratulations. Fun I know. You have both some of these. I mean, come on. And it lights up. Good to see you. Thank All you, right. Meredith. And to shop these products, head to today.com slash shop. And you can catch the Kansas City Chiefs. They're going to take on the Detroit Lions. It's big, y'all. Wow. NFL season kicks off Thursday night right here on NBC. That's Amazing. Tomorrow. And we'll be back right after this.
Thanks for having her. Guys, we're heading to the sunny island paradise of Bermuda, and we would love it if you came. Yeah, thanks to our sponsor, the Lauren Hotels. We are having a contest for one viewer and a guest to join us. So you will enjoy a five-day, four-night stay at their resort featuring ocean views, signature pink sandy beaches. So send us a video. Tell us why you would love a beach getaway. Okay, get those videos in, y'all. All you have to do is head to hotengine.com. The contest closes Monday night. Come to Bermuda with, with us. us. Come on. All right, tomorrow, celebrity chef Alex Gornicelli will be here. Plus, the designer Shay McGee with the keys to de elevating your home decor. We'll see you Thursday. Yeah, you know that today is Sean's birthday. Should we say happy, happy birthday, Sean? Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to Today. Every day, we are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on Today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's Today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. <laughs> Back in town, the miracle. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping and vine of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty and savory all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you gotta think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous 
Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've. I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886 started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you, did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no. But it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this, this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 30 three, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. What's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yes. 
you, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So, besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? Oh, Sleepwood here, she won't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just no. enough to mix the ingredients it's together right. and nothing more. That's right. And the Why big I ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. Oh 
I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? Good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do, and got nobody tell you go get me this or go get me that. Seventy-five-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961. I'll be 15 and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. OK, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance for more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing a teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay blue crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking.
Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart, so uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, what crab is Crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in DC, so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line, hundreds of people <laughs> on the block in, the, in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. 
genius. The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first we want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Oh. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's she's stay by me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and you know, make it handheld and on, on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind and of street eat. food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it doesn't right, taste good, probably exactly. you know, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a yeah, quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> Alright, so that's perfect right there. That's perfect, right, perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, and Lurie, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You had to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and the around the edges and then things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Ooh. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's the other piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alex, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake. 
taste it a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? Ten. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cooked my own food, you know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for you? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing, don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next morning. Oh, I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something mm -hmm. and the next day I make $80 something dollars. And I said, okay, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. 
His presence and his dedication. Jerk chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little. Let me. Kim, were you nervous? Oh about yeah, that? I'm so glad uh, you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different, and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this. You know, I can run this, no problem. But oh no, 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 no. I was ringing the the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know. One day it might be just me and you. You got to show right. me how to cut this meat. chicken and ox Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. Yeah. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern. And she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all that. It's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not an oxtail. <laughs> right. the, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Oh, Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper, mm. also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call. You have our Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. Oh, wow. 
then this is what we pour on it last give it that that good color then we just mix this up make sure you rub it in properly you want everything to rub into it you know if you take a smell of it even right now oh yeah you see you you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't even cook it smells it. smells good right he then lets the oxtails marinate overnight then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This, what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. When I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat, and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. OK, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I have my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I gotta try that. Oh, that's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pats? Uh -huh. This pat right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pat to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did. What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it is nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything's going to be all right.
Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not gonna even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang. A refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon, Anne working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand. Working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night, uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam, and turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Anne still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Anne agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at, at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at, at least three days. 
um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and pho at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes. Um, and that is because of the, you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just food tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. I admire her greatly. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food but Ethiopian culture. My name is Ine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands. You can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, 
where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, okay, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was the uh, one who hooked me up. To him, so. <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking for me. I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartar. When it's uh, done right, that's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habesh's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, OK, this is it. I, I think we're going to fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only three or four percent of our business. And overnight, we had to do a hundred percent of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food is not take out, so we had to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it boxing up to the orders. They did a lot, and they're part of the reason why we're still around, so. I'm sorry, I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business and a lot of people they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do, he covered. The same thing, he cannot cook. <laughs> so, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chef, 
and taqueros and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. You scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington candy shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn-of-the-century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element. Restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, 
largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we had the invention of Philadelphia-style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker, and he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man, he later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. We're proud to be here today. Bassett's was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women, to have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues 
and you know, can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> and see. We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, it's nice to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in DC for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. So Not to Harlem, not to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where a, upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Thumford's? Yes. Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Thumford's. 
small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference, and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And they're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tom Ford. Tom Ford was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop, but after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Ford's that are talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with little league kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>
can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or you know jam something you know things like that and now back to sunday school so what's my flavor so your flavor so we've heard around the way uh -huh. that you uh that you're a friend you're a fan of cookies and cream i am also you like sweet potato pie so i do okay so this is a combination and pecans of, well right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie but, but yeah. yes i can tell you guys are married <laughs> For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding Nilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust with pecan, uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with basically it's a holiday IPA, mm -hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blended it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture-perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta-da. Right. So, the cup, got a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, 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 look, now good. you're gonna form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're, mm -hmm. now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it That's is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually. Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, your neck of the woods. Oh, I like you get it. <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, cream berry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults funny they would share. <laughs> 
In Las Vegas, a few miles off the strip, is the flashy, fabulous, and insta-famous ice cream shop, Creamberry, opened in 2016 by husband and wife team Danny and Rosalina C., hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe. We set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy, innovative desserts into one place. For Danny, it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruit on top for the shaved ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino halo halo. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not gonna come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. Luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like, a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkle candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh, yeah, maybe not too much. Just maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry.
We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. Most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coney's in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So, what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit-style Coney, in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Oh. Hi, good to see oh, you again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. 
They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek. Now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gus and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kuros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. We that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people some good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. We're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili is a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America, and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah.
At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of conies. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and, a, and That's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop, like when you bite into it and oh, snap, snap. It's like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun, it's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little, grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're gonna grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to? No, I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy, some chili. Add a little more, you know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices, yes. that's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom, okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. Nice. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it, chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All more. Right. It's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go with it. you want the in. chili to go Yeah, in. you want the chili. You want it, yeah. I want that chili. You're chintz out on that yeah, chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier uh, for you to pour over there. All right. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. Yeah, mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. 
What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island Steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced you know, after the cooling conveyor. And then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory, you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family, family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. 
It's really nice being run by a family-owned business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan 
for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you could come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with his food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tastes so similar to it would as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us. But it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. Uh, 
I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomp and vine of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory. All in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and you can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> so Good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five minutes and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 yeah, years. Right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh-huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs. 
in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you, did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no. But it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. And you really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this, this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm gonna say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started in 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's Mom. really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? Oh, man, I sleep I with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together right. and nothing more. That's right. And the Why big it? ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch.
the Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning they did pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and got nobody to tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I'll be 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance of more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise 
and educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. So I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, love crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side, and pretty much I've um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food, so learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watching my grandmother cook a, a lot as well, so I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then, the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line 
hundreds of people <laughs> on the block in the in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was it was just may it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, the people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm gonna grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little? Bit? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, "What did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this?" And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just got to see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce in particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Okay. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't wanna put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's stayed by me, I like this. <laughs> I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular? Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind and of street eat. food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it doesn't right, taste good, right, exactly. you're gonna, uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're gonna um, do is uh, we're gonna take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. 
It's around like a yeah, quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. That's perfect, right, perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, and Lawrence, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You had to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and the around the edges and then things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry uh -huh. on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Ooh. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally? So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's Try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Hawk, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake. Tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. When you think Texas,